So here's a, perhaps a puzzling line from the gospel we just heard. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. So this is right after the baptism, the beautiful manifestation of Jesus to the world as the beloved Son of the Father, the Savior of the world, the one who has come to take the burden of sin upon himself. And this, that baptism which inaugur inaugurates his public life. So the first thing that Jesus does is he disappears into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. What? Why does the Holy Spirit lead the incarnate Son into the desert? Well, to understand this, we have to go back to the Old Testament. Let's go back to the Exodus. You know, the Lord is going to liberate his people from slavery to Egypt, 400 years of slavery. The time has now come for their liberation. And, and uh, he, uh, he tells them to leave Egypt after working mighty signs. And then immediately, what does the Lord do with his people? He takes them into the desert. They go straight out into a desert wasteland. It's like, what? Like, and what do, they, what do they encounter in the desert? Hunger, and thirst, hot sun. There's not much food out there. It's hard to survive out there. Water's very hard to find. It's a place they'll find out where the serpents are as well. But here's the thing. The Lord leads his people into the desert after the exodus because the desert is the place where they will encounter him. It is a place of formation and of intimacy. In their felt weakness in the desert, the people are stripped down of their, of their worldly securities. They're not in control. And, and this is the place in the desert where the Lord is going to form them into his people through the covenant. There they will receive his law. There they will be separated from the surrounding nations and the noise and the distractions. There he will teach them how to live, how to worship him, and most especially, how to depend on him, how to trust him. How to, to come to the realization that he can take care of them, even in the most inhospitable and dangerous places. He provides them in a miraculous way with the manna, preparing them for that eventual and ultimate gift of himself in his body and blood in the Eucharist. So that's the chosen people. There's a, there's a good reason why the Lord leads them out in the desert immediately after their liberation. Let's look at another place in the Old Testament. This is the first book of Kings. Elijah, greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Elijah is doing his vocation as, the, as this prophet in a very difficult time. Things uh, don't go well for him. The Queen Jezebel wants to kill him. And he flees into the wilderness, the desert. And there, um, he, he's, just, he's, he's just had it. Nothing seems to be working. His vocation seems to be a failure. And he goes out into the desert, and he, and he came to a broom tree and sat beneath it, and he prayed for death, saying, Enough, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. And there in the desert... He encounters the Lord, and the Lord feeds him and sustains him in a miraculous sort of way. He restores his strength, and the Lord tells him to, to walk 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, and there at Mount Horeb, he encounters the Lord not in the, the crushing wind and the, and, the, and the fire and everything that's big and powerful, but in the quiet voice. And there in the quiet voice, the Lord asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah explains to them, they've destroyed your altars, they've murdered your prophets by the sword, I alone remain, and they seek to take my life. And so at this low point of Elijah's life, where he's, his vocation and even the Lord's covenant seems to be a dismal failure, 
In this literal and figurative desert, God reveals himself and reveals to Elijah his saving plan for the restoration of Israel. Again, the desert is a place of encounter, of intimacy, of being stripped down, of learning to, to, to live on the Lord's grace and, and providing for us in an unexpected, often miraculous way. It's where we come to be formed by him, to learn from him. And so let's go back to the gospel then. So why does the Holy Spirit lead our Lord into the desert? Well, the gospel tells us that he was there for a time of temptation and of fasting. But there's a little clue here that although Jesus did not eat for 40 days, it was only when those 40 days were over that Luke says that he was hungry. I don't know about you, but after like 12 hours, right, be hungry. Right? It says after his fast of 40 days, he was hungry. Well, I think if we look at John chapter 4, there's a clue here. This John chapter 4 is when Jesus has this encounter with the Samaritan woman. Right? He's talking to her for a long time, and his, his disciples come back and say, Rabbi, you've got to have something to eat. And he says, you know, I have food that you don't know about. And they're like, what? Did somebody, somebody bring him something? He says, no. He said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus' food of those 40 days in the desert was communion with his Father. Communion and intimacy with the Father in prayer, doing the will of the Father. Jesus doesn't need to learn or to be formed in the desert, right? Like the chosen people or even the great prophet like Elijah, he's God. However, he as man is given this time of deep communion with the Father in preparation for his mission of saving the world. And that mission is starkly revealed in the desert, like the, with things that, that happen in the desert. They're starkly revealed that it is to defeat Satan, who has, who has captured us, right? And who does not want us to have what he has rejected. So let's get to perhaps a real important question in all of this. Why does God sometimes lead me into the desert? So our deserts can have different forms. There's deserts where we willingly go, like Lent, right, with his fasting and austerity and self-sacrifice and prayer and almsgiving. But there are many deserts that we don't choose for ourselves. They're deserts of difficult prayer, when God seems absent. Deserts of loneliness, of broken or strained relationships. Deserts of physical sickness and suffering, of emotional and mental anguish, of addiction, of grief for the loss of loved ones or the harm done to them. There are deserts of financial strain, Deserts of sorrow for our sins. Deserts of false accusation and misunderstanding. Deserts of longing for heaven and of impatience with the passing things of the world. And whatever its specific nature, the desert that comes upon us, or perhaps that we're led into, is allowed by our Heavenly Father for our good because he loves us. He not only allows these deserts to come, but in the Holy Spirit can even drive us into those deserts. Because you have to remember, salvation history is our story. It's the story of our own life. And so let's learn from those stories. What can we learn from the chosen people being in the desert? It's a place of encounter, of intimacy, of formation. And even when Israel is, is shown to be an unfaithful spouse to the Lord, like in the book of Hosea, what, is the, what does the Lord say? I will lead them out into the desert, and I will speak to their hearts and betroth them to me. The desert is a place not only of, of encounter and intimacy, it's of honeymoon. It is of, it is of 
is a time of, of intense relationship with each other. Because sometimes it's only in the desert that we can learn to trust the Lord and to depend solely upon Him. When we cannot fix things, when our worldly securities fail, when we can't take care of ourselves, when we must endure, when we're at the end of our rope, we learn to depend on Him, to have faith, to persevere in hope, that He can provide for us even in the most inhospitable and dangerous places. And there He can heal and restore. Those deserts are also the place where He, can teach, where he teaches us to live, and more importantly, how to worship Him, where we learn the commandments, where we learn how to live as God Himself lives. In the desert, we can realize our weakness, and we can learn compassion for those who suffer, to learn empathy and love, for we all struggle in the desert at one time or another in life. And in the desert, we learn to worship Him as He asks to be worshipped. In our false worldly security, we can think worship is something I do when I feel like it, when it's convenient. But in the desert, we realize that He is the most important reality, the foundation, the center, the goal. Without Him, that we're surely going to perish. We realize that the rest of the world will always disappoint. And in those deserts, we can detach from the world to learn that only God is worthy of our worship and adoration. What can we learn from Elijah? When we're threatened and filled with fear and disappointment, we feel like our life and our work and our vocation is not accomplishing what we'd hope, perhaps even feels like a failure, perhaps actually even is a failure. We can learn to recognize the quiet voice of God speaking to us in the midst of all of that. To know that He is truly with us, sustaining us by His grace and, and presence, and that He always provides a way forward, often in an unexpected way. And what can we learn from our Lord Jesus? Those times in the desert can be the opportunity for real and profound communion with our Father as a beloved son or daughter. And so we're driven into the wilderness to get rid of the distractions and the false priorities. When a little superficial prayer isn't cutting it, when we desperately need to hear God's voice, in the desert we can learn that we are invited to something deeper, in prayer that is honest and serious and perseverant and that only communion with our Heavenly Father can satisfy and fulfill our deepest hunger and to crush the power of Satan in our lives. So the Father's plan is always for our good and our salvation. The desert is part of that that there's only one road to the land of promise, and that leads through the desert. There is no other way to prepare for the deeper life that we are to receive. And we must know that the desert is an essential part of the life of grace. All the masters of the spiritual life will tell us that the greatest growth in holiness happens in the desert. So if you find yourself in the desert, let's remember that it's a privileged, privileged place, a place of opportunity, of communion, of intimacy, of formation. And no one can avoid their time in the desert if they desire holiness. So here's where we come to our mission. Lent it itself is a time in the desert preparation of letting the Lord strip away the things that do not ultimately matter and to focus on what really does matter, our relationship with Jesus Christ that is living and profound and transformative.